Well, good morning and welcome again to Durham Baptist Online. Uh, I've been looking at the news over this past week, as I regularly do, and considering all the, the turmoil that's been going on around the world, particularly in the United States, and something struck me this past week. It struck me how quickly we forget. And that's going to be an important theme for our message uh, this morning. I think it's becoming increasingly clear that all the violence uh, that's being perpetrated by uh, these uh, radical uh, organizations um, and groups uh, that are claiming to be, you know, uh, protesting, protesting against discrimination and against racism, uh, that really that they are, that they're putting forward a deliberate ploy to ruin uh, their country, uh, particularly in the United States, so that it can be uh, remade according to the agendas and the ideology of those that are political protagonists who are working from behind the scene. And it, this really struck me. And there's nothing new about this. Uh, this is a ploy that has been uh, in operation uh, for a long time uh, by many different groups. Now, catchy introduction, have I got your attention? Are you thinking you, you don't believe me or you think perhaps that I'm being too conspiratorial or too dramatic about that? Well, let me just suggest, um, do a little bit of research, a bit of reading, if you will, and uh, have a look at the schemes and the tactics that was being used by the, the Nazis leading up to World War II. And again, by the communists in, in Russia and China as they overtook their countries. And as we do, we see that it's the same game plan and much of the same tactics are being used elsewhere, including in the United States today. As they say, a leopard never changes his spots. So what's your point, you might be thinking? What's your point, Pastor Stephen? What does this have to do with our passage that we're looking at this morning? Well, simply this. I think many people who are citizens of Western nations have forgotten the, the Christian heritage upon which our societies have been built in the West. They have forgotten that going back away, our nations uh, in Christian, post-Christian nations as they are now, they had often embedded in their constitutions uh, the idea that God was sovereign over our nations. And they have forgotten whose they are as people that belong to these nations as citizens. In fact, not only have they forgotten, they've rejected all of that Christian heritage. So in this morning's passage, we find the author of Hebrews reminding these Jewish believers, remember he was writing to Jewish uh, Christians, uh, believers in Christ, of the things that they should never forget. And they, it speaks to us too of what we should not forget if we want to remain the true church or household of God and not lose our sense of, of unity, of, of confidence and our hope and our sense of identity. So as we do, with that in mind, as we've been doing usually, let's pause the video here, uh, take a quick look at your Bibles, have another quick read through, and when you've done that, come back again. Well, welcome back. As we dive into the passage uh, this morning, our first point is that we should never forget to whom we belong. Never forget to whom you belong. In chapter 3, uh, verse 1, now let me read that out again. It says, Therefore, holy brothers and sisters, holy brethren, who share in the, the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus. Consider Jesus. So this idea of holy brothers that the author was referring to, or brethren who share in this heavenly calling, this is to say that these are the ones, us who believe in Christ, who have been set apart, we're holy, we've been set apart because we don't belong to this world, we're set apart from this world. 
We are the, the brethren, we are the family who belong to this heavenly calling. Now, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 14, we have Paul's testimony that he was pressing on, he says, pressing on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The upward call, or as some translations put it, the heavenly calling. We have a heavenly calling because of who we are, because of who we belong to. We belong to God, the Father of all, who have been born again. Therefore, we ought to live as these ones who are God's children, as those who belong in heaven, as holy citizens of heaven, as the family of God. Now, the author gives us instructions to help us to know how to live uh, in this world while we know that we belong uh, to the heavenly family. And he says, Consider this, or as in this translation, fix your thoughts. To consider, it, it means to think deeply, to ponder on, to meditate upon. If we want to, uh, if, we, if we, to make our practice of meditating regularly uh, and often on the life, on, on the teachings, on the ministry of Jesus Christ as the Son of God from heaven, then we will find ourselves reflecting that nature of Jesus Christ in our own daily walk. And it's in that context that the author says, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest uh, of our confession. So let's have a think about that. The apostle. That word apostle, it, it simply means a sent one or a one who is commissioned. Jesus came as the sent one from the Father. He came only to do the Father's will as the Father's representative to this world, knowing that it would mean uh, deep trials, uh, persecution, suffering, and even death. He was uh, never for a, a moment deterred, though, that despite facing all these troubles, never deterred from doing the Father's will uh, by the way that the world that, uh, treated him. And that's how it should be for us too. As we follow Jesus and we consider Jesus, we should reflect that same attitude. And as to being our high priest, as we have seen before, uh, a, a priest's responsibility is to represent uh, God to the people uh, and to reveal uh, the, God's grace and truth to the people and to represent the people to God. The high priest, uh, though he had a, a very high standing uh, uh, of his position of honor amongst the people, he was never, though, to take uh, advantage of this office, this high standing. He was always to be one who could uh, be identified with the suffering and humility of the people that he served. And this was certainly true of Jesus. And it should be true of us, too, again, as we consider Jesus, we see how this has an impact on our lives. So let's think about that. When we are tempted to, be, to, to feel overwhelmed by all the, the suffering that we face in this life, don't forget. Don't forget to where and to whom we belong. We belong to the family of God and we, have, we share in this heavenly calling we are saints, the holy ones of God. We are members of God's house. And we are to live as those who are holy, as long, those who belong to, in heaven. All that is of this world, we need to keep this in mind. All that is of this world is destined to pass away, to be destroyed. But we have been uh, given new birth into a, a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never sp uh, perish, spoil, or fade, that is being kept in heaven for you. That's 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. But also, there's the other side of it as well. There are times when we are tempted, aren't we? To be honest, tempted to think a little bit more of ourselves than we should, or perhaps... Uh, 
less of others around us than we should. And we need at those times to again consider Jesus, to remember the Son of God who came not to exalt himself, but to honor his Father and to serve God in representing the people and identifying with them in their suffering. Now, it's precisely because Jesus was faithful in serving God and in representing his people that he was appointed over God's house. And that brings us to our second point uh, this morning. And we should never forget who is Lord over the household of God. So in verse 2, let me read that out for you. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all of God's house. So we see Jesus faithful to him who appointed him. And we could assume, um, just natural for us perhaps, we could think this way, we could assume that Jesus could have easily presumed upon his position and authority as the Son of God. He could have rightly demanded subservience and, and obedience and honor from the Jewish nation to which he came as, as one of them. And in fact, from the whole world, because he truly was the Son of God. He was God. But instead, we find he never sought his own glory, but faithfully carried out the plan of the Father who had appointed him. This was Jesus' consistent attitude. He came to fulfill the Father, uh, the will of the Father as, as a servant. He said he came not to be served, but to serve. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 7, the Apostle Paul said that Jesus made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant. Despite severe opposition from the religious leaders, the frustrating lack of faith amongst the people, the dullness of hearts and minds amongst his disciples, Jesus never gave up on his mission, which he'd been sent to do, which he was commissioned for. He was faithful always to his father who had appointed him. So to illustrate this point, the author of Hebrews used the example of, of Moses who also faced great opposition and lack of faith among the people. Yet Moses also remained faithful uh, to the Lord who had appointed him uh, to lead and to, to serve the people in his house. And we saw that uh, several months ago, didn't we, uh, as we were working our way through the book of Exodus on Sunday mornings. But now here we are introduced to a very important term, one that I've already mentioned several times, the house of God. And we pick it up in verse 3. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all of God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. But Christ is faithful as the Son over God's house. So here's this theme of the house of God, and it's a, a theme that we see uh, written in other letters and books of the Bible. And by house, uh, the author was not referring to the building, of course, the physical structure, but the household of God, meaning namely the people who belonged to God. Now, in Bible times, a man's household would include all of those who were, of, uh, who were living under his roof, uh, those that were coming under his protection and who were under his authority. And this could include uh, all the, uh, a number of the members of his extended family, as well as servants and slaves. Technically, the, the house of God, in this same sense, therefore could include also his angels, uh, who, as we've seen in, in chapter 1, verse 7, he sends as his ministering spirits to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. Now, 
Of all those who have been appointed by God to serve in his house, we might uh, think of uh, that there was none greater than, than Moses. He was given the privilege of being allowed, we're told, to meet with God face to face. And every time he did, it, we're told that the glory of God would shine upon him such that it would remain upon him. And as he came away from his meetings with God, his face would continue to shine with the glory of God. But that glory would slowly fade away. There was one, however, who was counted as gr of greater glory than Moses. And that, of course, is Jesus, Jesus Christ, whose glory will never fade. So here the, the author of Hebrews, he describes uh, the comparison between uh, the worthiness of Moses and of Jesus as being like the difference between a builder of a house and those who live in it. You know, people, uh, we, we can look at the, the grandeur of a great building. We can think of some of the buildings in our big cities. Uh, opera house is very distinctive. Some of the tall skyscrapers and the like, or some of our, our museums, these grand buildings. And, and in admiration, people will praise the builder who built it. You know, the, the great imagination or the skill of the architect or, or the capacity of the builder to be able to put it all together. Now, they may acknowledge uh, the, the ones who live and serve or work within the building as being worthy of some honor, you know, because they, they belong to that house um, or they, they serve there or whatever. But the real praise will go to the builder. And so for, as for Moses, he did not build the house of God. He was part of it as one who was appointed to serve uh, within it. But Jesus, as the Son of God, he was the son of both the builder and the owner of the house, since God is both the builder and the owner. And so Jesus was appointed to be Lord over the house of God. Now, in those days, uh, the, the patriarch of a family, of a household, you know, the senior male who had the authority over the household, he, he was considered to be Lord over it. Often, however, he may have to have gone away on a long business trip or something like that, or it may be that he's becoming quite elderly and not quite up to the task of overseeing his household anymore. So he would appoint uh, another to take on the responsibilities of being Lord over the household. And that privilege and responsibility would often go to his firstborn son. So Jesus, as God's firstborn, was appointed as Lord over God's house and is worthy of much greater honor than even Moses. Now here, we, we have an inherent warning. One of the greatest errors, I think, or sins that we've seen at work throughout uh, the centuries of the church as we've seen it over the past, has been the refusal of men to allow Jesus Christ to be truly Lord over his house. In Ephesians uh, chapter 4, verse uh, 19, the Apostle Paul, writing to the believers of, in Christ uh, as the church in Ephesus, he reminds them that they were members of the household of God, over whom Christ is the head, as he puts it in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. But tragically, too often, we don't see churches operating as if Christ was the, the head or the Lord of the church, as men uh, uh, who are very forceful uh, men uh, seek to find their positions of leadership and take control. So what does this all, uh, all of this mean for us today? Well, it means that Jesus Christ, as Lord over God's household, is worthy of our full obedience, of our full worship. And that brings us to our last point uh, from this passage today. And it comes up in the last part of verse 6. It says, I'll, I'll read it again. 
But Christ is faithful as the Son over God's house, and we are His house if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory, or in which we boast, as some translations put it. So in verse 6, the author is reminding us that we should never forget what we are, namely that we are the household of God. That is to say, being part of the church is not something we do, it's something we are. So this comes, I think, as a word of comfort and encouragement, since belonging to the household of God brings with it uh, a great, great privileges and blessings, as well as the protection uh, of God uh, from his enemies. But there is also an obligation on our part if we truly want to be God's household. The author tells us that we will be God's house if we hold fast to our confidence and the hope in which we glory or boast. Now, someone's going to say, as many have argued uh, and, and written, uh, that the author here is suggesting that if we lack confidence in our faith or, or lose our hope, uh, that we will be at risk of perhaps being cast out of God's house, of, of, out of God's family. And it's as if to say that we might actually lose our salvation. But that's not what the author is saying here, and we need to have this clear. He was not referring to the loss of our salvation, which has already been made secure for us in heaven. But he's talking about the loss of our existence together as God's church, God's household here on earth. For example, a couple of things that bring this out, or one in particular, the word, when he talks about confidence, that word here refers specifically to our confidence in our speech. So the author is deliberately alluding back to what he already talked about when he, he spoke of our confession, our confession of our faith that he'd said earlier, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he is the apostle and high priest that has been appointed for us. You see, if we, if we lack confidence in our faith, we will fail to proclaim this faith, this gospel to one another and to others who are yet to become part of the household of God. But as Paul said, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13, it is in our faith and knowledge of the Son of God that we find our unity. It's a travesty. That so many churches, having lost <clears throat> their confidence in the faith and in the true gospel, that they then look to maintain their, their unity in what they do because they've forgotten who or what they are as the household of God. So in closing, let me draw this together. And if you would let me uh, put it, uh, quite firmly. Church, let me remind you, never forget to whom you belong. Never forget who is Lord over the household of God. Never forget who or what you are as the household of God. Hold fast to your confidence in your faith and in your hope in all that is being kept safe for you in heaven. Make that your boast and not anything that is in or of this world. We shouldn't boast in any of our possessions, our profits, our positions of privilege or prestige, our plans or our programs. And that goes not only for us as individuals or families, it goes for us as the whole household of God, as, as a church. Our hope, our boast is in the Lord and in His glory, in which we also will share if we remain faithful as God's household. With that in mind, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to again to give you our praise, 
that you have sent Jesus Christ, your son. You commissioned him and he was faithful, faithful as a servant in your household, though a son. And we thank you that he came as our high priest, an apostle, the one sent to reveal and make you known to us. And as a high priest to open up the way by which we could be made right with you again. We thank you that through Christ, we are made members of your household, your family. And there we find a deep sense of identity and belonging. And we know that we have this heavenly calling, that there is our true place of belonging with you in glory. But Lord, you know that we often struggle because we, we are frail in our faith. Forgive us, Lord, when we forget to look to you to to strengthen us and to enable us. And we lose sight, we forget. We forget who we are, who we belong to. We forget who is the true Lord over the church. Forgive us, Lord, when we forget what we are as the household of God. Forgive us, Lord, and remind us often. And enable us, Lord, to, Lord, to hold true, hold fast to the true faith to the true gospel, to our hope, which is our share in the glory of Christ in heaven above. Lord, we thank you for your sure word that encourages us. May we live lives that are truly as your holy family, your holy children, while we wait for the return of our Lord. Father, we ask these things for Christ's sake. Amen.